in every sphere of my life, I will worship you. I'll worship you. You're my delight in all that I desire. We're full of praise, we welcome you here. 
Testing. Right, guys, we're getting ready to start tonight. So if you're sitting in the lounge or outside in the veranda or in the coffee shop, let's uh, get ready to take our seats because uh, we're all live streaming tonight. So we want to keep to punctuality if we can. Welcome to those that are here. Is this uh, that okay? Happy the volume. All right. Okay. Come through. Come through from the lounge and the other spaces and let's get ready to rock and roll
Right. Good evening, everybody. How are you all doing? Looking forward to a great evening together tonight and uh, weekend. Tomorrow morning again, I just to remind you, and then uh, tomorrow evening, uh, David and the search folks have arranged a testimony and worship uh, evening. It's around the same theme, and we have a couple of people going to open their stories up to us, and I think that's, that can be very refreshing for us, a cause to celebrate as we hear how God has graced people's lives and worked things through. So welcome to all of you. Great to have you with us. Alexander will be coming up just now, but we're going to start by just honoring the Lord for who He is as the, the God of grace and mercy and forgiveness, and God of hope. Eh? He gives us hope and He transforms our lives. So why don't we stand and we pray and we'll ask Shana to lead us in worship. Let's raise our hands to the Lord as we just acknowledge Him. Lord, we thank You. You are the one who leads us in triumphal procession. And this week we celebrate Your ascension. On Thursday this week we celebrate that You are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We acknowledge You to be our God, our life giver, our Father. And tonight as we worship You, Lord, lift our hearts in Your presence. We pray we would know, we would know You more deeply. We would experience You. We would know Your presence and, and, and hear your word that speaks hope into our lives. And Lord, we pray you meet each one of us. Meet us where we are. Help us to know you better as a result of being here this weekend. And any who come carrying guilt and shame and confusion, Lord, we pray that this would be a time of clarity and deliverance and liberation in Jesus' name. And all the Lord's people said, Amen. Amen.
With it. 
Lord, you're so good, so good. We love your presence, Lord. We love your favor, your grace, and your mercy toward us, Lord. So good, so good, so good. Thank you that you're the God of the second chance, you're the God of hope, the God of forgiveness, the God who brings forth life from that which was dead. Lord, we bless you for your presence here tonight, that you are amongst us, you're in the midst of us, to effect your kingdom, your reign in our lives. So we welcome your spirit. We welcome your presence, Lord. And we say yes to your plans and your purposes. That tonight you are amongst us to turn lives around, to lift off burdens, cast off shame. You are amongst us tonight to restore and even to give back to which they, that which the locust has eaten, to give it back to us, the years the locusts have eaten. Lord, thank you that you're in the midst of us tonight as the God who restores, the Father who calls us as his sons and daughters and loves on us, even from a far country. So we bless you, Lord, for your presence tonight and thank you for the, the hope we have in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> you may be seated. <coughs> thank you so much, Sean. Now you're an absolute gift to us. We really appreciate you. Give her a hand, man. She's so faithful. Thank you, Sean. Sean. Awesome. We really love you. I want to say welcome to those who are watching from all over South Africa and elsewhere. Welcome to you guys. Trust that you'll enjoy tonight and each of the sessions, um, except for tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night will not be live streamed, unfortunately. It will be recorded, and we'll use that on discretion. But uh, we have a couple people sharing stories tomorrow night that we want to give them the safest place space possible to, to share. That tomorrow night won't be recorded, just mentioning that, especially for the people watching and listening in from elsewhere um, on request, we can consider whether it would be appropriate to share that. But uh, the rest tonight, tomorrow morning, double session tomorrow at 9 and uh, I guess about 11, the second half. And uh, Sunday morning, Sunday morning will be a celebration here, a continuation and climax of this, uh, uh, of this event, this Healthy Sexuality Conference. I shouldn't use some of this first climax. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I just, sometimes these things happen, you know. <laughs> How many of you ever said the dumbest thing and you realize also what you said? Has that ever happened to you? Am I the only one? Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, welcome again to all of you. What we're going to do now, um, if you've got a phone, Josh, come up here. Come and help me. You, you come and explain this thing. Uh, we've been blessed by Benny who's put together a, a questionnaire. We, we'd like you to, to tackle it. It'll be completely anonymous. And, uh, and the second half of this evening, because we're going to have two halves to, tonight, we will give you the results of this question. But I want to say to you, it's totally safe and uh, uh, totally anonymous. So Josh, explain to us. 
Thanks, Benny. Thank you. So, Simo's going to put up a QR code. So, And then I'll just walk around and let people, because they can't see me from here. There you go, Stuart. Oh, I don't have your number. Who's still struggling? And looks like most of you are, are in there. Okay. Dave's done. Dave, Dave gets the chocolate for being number one first, finishing it. Dave Hobson second. Well done, Dave. Anyone else finished? Norman, I don't see you typing there. I'm worried. It's a good way to stretch ourselves, eh? For those of us who have never seen one of these in our lives, we, we're stretching our faith here. We, Okay, so once you're in, just answer the questions. And for those that aren't married, you'll see there's an option to say not married or married. And some questions are applicable just for married people and others for unmarried people. And then you just end your survey and a bit later on we'll see all the results. And remember, it's anonymous. No one's going to know what you've answered. So just answer truthfully because it is completely anonymous. Thank you. Okay, just shout, lift your hand if you need any help. Okay, who needs help? Anybody need a bit of help with the questionnaire? Just checking here. 
Yo, okay, because Josh is going to run around. Stuart's running around. Everybody okay? So, the intention is uh, that um, this will give us an idea of what we are contending with. And Alexander will have an idea as he goes into the weekend um, what our experience has been in the realm of sexuality so that we are scratching where the itch, as it were. You know, we're speaking with relevance. So, uh, in a few moments, Alexander is going to come up and he's going to share with us. I'll introduce him. And, uh, and then when he, after our short break, halfway through, uh, we will give you the results of this. It'll go up on the screen as well in some kind of pie charts as well, just to let you know what's happening here. Yeah? But emphasize again, it's totally anonymous. So it's more, the more honest you can be, the better it will be for our understanding what we're contending with. Okay. Anybody need more time? You all okay? I know you're playing games as well and answering your emails and things. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, tonight, guys, it's a privilege for us to have Alexander Finter all the way from now, from Belito, from KZN. All right? So it's his Schlange, Belito? Yeah? Uh, they, he was up in... Uh, a church in Johannesburg for many years following Jesus. He was part of a, a community up there on the field. We call it the field, a farm, a communal farm. And uh, we've walked together since about, I've met you in 1985. I remember down at Betty's Bay at some of those Betty's Bay guys meeting when we were figuring out how to do church in a way that serves the kingdom. So we've had a, a, a long-running friendship. And um, it was a time, I just want to tell you about this, it was a time in my own life when I was going through some significant soul shifts and crises in uh, figuring some things out. And I went up and stayed on that farm for four days. And Alexander and Bruce Boynes prayed with me for four days, days and nights. And I so appreciated the, the brotherhood, the, the, the confidentiality, and accountability, and transparency of it, and the commitment. And I've always had great respect for Alexander and his uh, um, perceptiveness and his courage to speak things out as openly and honestly and, and uh, accurately as, as possible. He's married to Jill. Two, two children that are already out of the home, so he can tell you as much about them as, he, as he'd like to. Um, and it's been an absolute delight to walk this journey with him. Alexander was on the national leadership of the vineyard for many, many, many years. Um, uh, and we're actually the same age. We're born the same year. Do you know that? Eh? Yeah? <laughs> All right. And somebody said to me the other day, Alexander, they said, um, you're very young inside, but you're old outside. So I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> Put your hands together. Welcome, Alexander. I was wondering why there was no response. Good evening, everyone. It's, it's really good to see the attendance. Thank you for coming. Wow. Um, I'm just going to get my PowerPoint ready. Um, good. Well, th thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Uh, I'm going to just get some water going so that I'm in the groove. We're going to have... Um, half a session, then a five-minute break, and the reward after the break is to get the results of the survey we're all doing. So while I'm I was, I don't know, halfway through, I got going there, then I was called up to speak. But you guys will continue the survey and press whatever it is, click or go or, or finish, <laughs> and then we'll get all the results. It might be interesting to have a look. Um, Great. So, um, the PowerPoint will be driven from the back. Uh, I will give indications or... Um, Simone. Have I pronounced it correct? Okay, we'll drive the PowerPoint. Uh, so what I want to do, if you get up the PowerPoint, I'm going to start off by just reading some scripture. Paul says to Timothy... He says, give attention to the public reading of the Word of God. 
So I want to do just some public reading to introduce this whole subject of human sexuality, to focus our minds, and then I will get into the talk. But before I do, I just want to honor the presence of Jesus and uh, invoke the Holy Spirit's work among us. So Lord, again, I personally just want to say thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for drawing us all together. Thank you for everyone online. Thank you, Lord, for the work of your Spirit that brings to us the cross of Jesus and the power of the resurrection. Lord, have your way as I teach. Just you speak, Lord. You speak to our hearts. You open our minds. Bring healing. I pray for words of healing. I pray for words of wisdom, words of knowledge. I pray for gifts of discerning of spirits. I pray even for the gift of faith for some people here tonight, for gifts of healings of different kinds. Lord, we are utterly and totally dependent upon you. This is a big subject, a highly emotive and complex subject. Just pray, help us, Lord, and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. So, Genesis chapter 1. And uh, you don't need to look it up. I have it up on, um, um, up, up on the screen. Just listen, even if you want to close your eyes. But just listening to God's Word can be powerful. It speaks to you. In the beginning, God... Hebrew word ground, which is Adama. So it's actually earthling, human being. He was not male, as we know it in that statement. Then David says in Psalm 139, Lord... from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together. Your eyes saw my unformed body, the affirmation of the body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's, that is remarkable. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast are the sum of them. God's thoughts about me about my body, about my formation. The Song of Songs, 8 verse 6. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like the very flame of Yahweh. The whole book of the Song of Songs is a poem of erotic love and sexuality. And the rabbis call the Song of Songs the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament Scripture. Because it's a, it's, it's a parable of God's relationship with Israel, with his people, a love relationship. And it's the only place where Yahweh is mentioned is this verse at the end of the Song of Song. Love, as in human sexuality, comes from God, the very flame of Yahweh. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, You know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, set apart, made holy to God, that you should avoid Sexual immorality, the Greek word pornea, which is a very important word which you'll see as we go through the seminar. 
that each of you should learn to control your own body. It's an alternative reading in the NIV from the Old King James, which is, each of you should learn to live with your own wife. In other words, don't lust after others. Control your body in a way that is holy and honorable to God and to one another. Don't live in passionate lust, lusts like the pagans who do not know God. And that, in this matter of sexuality, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or a sister of one another. So, as the Anglicans would say, the Lord bless the reading of his word. And then the answer for the Anglicans is something about... Uh, 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 what is here, here, amen, or something? <laughs> I was never an Anglican, but I do remember say, hear the word of the Lord. The Lord blesses reading to us. So, just to again say thank you for inviting me, Dave Colleen. Uh, I'm honored to do this conference, and I'm aware this is a very important conference. I'm aware that this is a very big subject, and that it is very emotive. It is very sensitive, it is complex, and it is also controversial. And so inevitably, in not only what I say, but in the way I say it, you might well take offense or be concerned. Uh, we won't agree on everything, so we must agree to disagree agreeably. But hopefully, I'm going to, by God's grace, as much as I know how to work with the Holy Spirit, speak truth. And where I don't, then forgive me. But this subject is profoundly personal, but it is especially relational. It affects not only us personally, sexuality, healthy human sexuality, but it affects society, it goes to the roots of society, and also to politics. The politics of human relationships, how we treat one another, um, it goes to the issue of abuse, the way we use and abuse one another for our own purposes, our own pleasure or satisfaction. And the, the common phrase today, identity politics, and of course the ideological and cultural wars around human sexuality. Never in history has human sexuality developed into such an ideological battle that is both intensely personal and deeply social and political. And as I unpack this, as we go along, you'll understand what I'm saying if you don't grasp what I'm saying right now. So hopefully we'll touch it at all those levels, personal, social, and even political. Human sexuality is essentially about relationality. We are Adam and Eve, and human beings were created by relationship, in relationship, for relationship. And human sexuality is essentially about relationship. God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is an eternal community. And it says, let us create human beings. Actually, in Hebrew, let us create Adam from the Adama. Let us create an earthling from the earth, a human being. And uh, that idea us creating a human being. Human beings are created by relationship, the Trinity, in relationship as male and female, for relationship as male and female. Um, it is fundamental to human sexuality that we understand it's not just personal. It is profoundly social and relational. So it's not only about my feelings, my identity, and my fulfillment. It is profoundly about us how we live and relate together and experience ourselves in relationship to each other. So I personally, Alexander, as uh, Dave has introduced me, I consider myself just a fellow traveler. Uh, I am introducing myself more and more <laughs> when I'm invited to speak. Is, uh, my life journey is just simply to follow Jesus and learn from Jesus his teachings and to live them and then to teach them, which are essentially about the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of love. So I'm just a fellow traveler, a fellow disciple who's a wounded healer, 
Um, I have my own wounds, and many of them are still not fully healed, and I'm on the, the, the road to healing and to wholeness. So I don't speak as an expert, and I don't speak as one who's arrived. I work with my stuff even as I help to teach and minister to others. So we are all, in a very, in a very real way, w w wounded healers. And the parable of the wounded healer, the story of the wound wounded healer that the rabbis used to teach in the oral tradition that was recorded in the Talmud, the Jewish rabbinical writings from 250 AD to 500 AD they were written down, is a remarkable story of the Messiah as the wounded healer. And it simply teaches this, the extent to which you are in touch with your own unresolved brokenness, your own wounds, to that extent you can have compassion and mercy on your fellow traveler and help them in their wounds to get healed by learning to take responsibility for your own wounds and to work with your own healing process. The extent to which you are not in touch with your brokenness and your wounds and your unresolved stuff, to that extent we treat each other harshly, superficially, without empathy or compassion, but in legalistic attitudes of righteousness. And to that extent, we actually further damage one another. And we don't impart any healing. In fact, we, pr we transfer our unresolved blind spots onto others. So the concept of the wounded healer is profoundly important. I must remember to look at the camera. Greetings to all those out there. I'm also talking to you. So this, is, this whole seminar, I could say, are the, con are the confessions of a vineyard pastor. <laughs> Dave can close, put his fingers in his, in his ears as I confess. But I just want to say up front that, that I confess that I'm part of a species on planet Earth called spiritual leaders and pastors that sadly have a very, very checkered history of use and abuse of God's people. And I don't need to mention names. I think you're all aware of a lot of fallen leaders who've just really disqualified themselves by deeply damaging people. And often, and probably mostly, it's sexual, with spiritual abuse of power and sometimes financial abuse. So also, as pastors, the confessions of a pastor, we must confess that the church, in general, has given a message to the world in its body language, a very mixed, broken message when it comes to human sexuality. And the tradition of being anti-gay, anti-LGBTI, that is perceived and experienced by the LGBTI community generally as rejection and even hatred. And it is, it is, a, it is a shame upon the church in terms of the, the mixed messages that we've given. Uh, I, in a book long time ago that I read about the message of the church um, to the world about sexuality is that sexuality is a gift from God, but it's dirty. Be careful. And it's very mixed messages with our own brokenness. So God help us. So you have here speaking to you a person who speaks through certain lenses. And I must acknowledge my lenses while I take a sip of water. I'm a human being, first and foremost. That's the first lens that I wear through which I interpret the world. Then I'm a male human being. On top of that, I'm a white male human being. And on top of that, a white male human being in South Africa, born under apartheid, with krach da de as the as the the way of of the male, the Afrikaans male. I am a fenter, and I am a husband. I'm a father, and I'm also a Christ follower. So in all academic studies and in preaching and teaching one has to learn the older you get to really be in touch with your own lenses 
so that you acknowledge them because I don't see the world in a neutral, pure, unadulterated fashion. I see it through the formation of my life and what has conditioned me. And hopefully, as much as Christ can help me through my studies and prayerfulness, I share more of the pure truth than of my conditioned interpretation of the truth. But that's up to you to measure and to evaluate. As the Berean Christians in Acts chapter 17, when they heard Paul, they went home to search the scriptures to see whether these things were really so. And uh, you should be noble as they were. And uh, don't take everything that I say as true, because it's all, at the end, end of the day, still an interpretation through the lenses that I carry. But hopefully, by God's grace, if you hear the truth, it will set you free. Because it's the truth that sets us free. And so the importance of story and storytelling. So I have a story, and all of our stories are sacred, deeply personal and sacred. You have a story, and when I often sit with people and begin to hear their stories, I heard a little bit of a story over half an hour uh, eating tonight, and I'm always reminded when I sit with a person and hear their story, I continually get the feeling I must now take off my shoes because I'm on holy ground. Because as I listen to someone's story, I begin to see the bush burning. Because the image of God always shines through and comes through people's stories. God is in your story. And you need to be in touch with your story and know your story and take ownership. But then our story, your story, my story is also our story. It's the story of the church in the world today and our fundamental loss of integrity and credibility in the eyes of the world because of sexual scandals and sexual brokenness. Allah, Ravi Zacharias recently and others other leaders. But it's also our story of society, our story of South African society that is the Mount Everest of sexual brokenness in the world. Every 26 seconds, on average, the statistics tell us a woman and or child is abused by a so-called man. Every 26 seconds in South Africa, a woman or child is raped by a species that we call men in South Africa. And there's a history of explanation as to why we've come to this place in our societal reality that is incredibly brutal and violent and abusive. So sexually, sexual-based violence. Our story as South Africa, we need to own it. Our story as church, we need to own it. I trying to own my story and be in touch with it. You have a personal story that is coming out in this little survey with the answers that you give. But then there's God's story. And God's story will come up. Uh, so, are we not having the slides? It's fine. If, if the slides are up or not up. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. I'm just going to speak. If they're there or not, they're there. So God's story is really important because your story, my story, our story finds meaning and purpose to the extent it's interpreted by God's story. God's story gives meaning, redemption, and transformation to our stories. So at the end of the day, this is all about God's story. So sexuality is probably the issue of our day. Uh, you know, people claim it's economics. People claim it's eco the ecological crisis. There are different issues that dominate human consciousness it, globally. The corona pandemic dominates our consciousness at this time. But arguably, sexuality and its, its, its utter mess is the issue of today. And it's about ethics, personal ethics, social ethics, and also political ethics. And so I want to take the approach of ethics and morality and spend a little time explaining that, and then we're going to come to laying out the agenda of what I'm going to be talking about. And that will bring us to the halfway mark. Then we're going to have a pause, and then we will have the results of the survey when we come back after five minutes. So my just a little bit about me. I was, was uh, raised in a non-Christian home. 
He didn't know Jesus at all. Then got led to the Lord by David Genetsky at the, at the First Baptist Church in East London in 1968 under Rex Matthey, Uncle Rex Matthey. And uh, then a year later, I got a guy at school, Tony Shelver, from the Assemblies of God who laid hands on my head and I spoke in tongues. And Rex Matthey had a, he threw a cadenza when I spoke in tongues. So I migrated from the, <laughs> the Baptist Church to the Assemblies of God and ended up in the Assemblies of God ministry. And when I went into the ministry, full-time ministry in 1975, as a young pastor, so I've been in full-time ministry, planting and pastoring churches since 1975. So that's now 40, 45, 46 years down the track. I began my studies with UNISA, academic studies. And I did an undergraduate degree in majored in history and biblical studies. But because I wanted to study further in theology, especially ethics, I had to do another degree. So I did a whole, at UNISA in those days, you couldn't go on to honors and masters. You had to go back to the undergraduate. So I did another theological degree, all theological courses, but I majored in missiology and theological ethics. And then I did honors in theological ethics, and I specialized in theological ethics. So in theological ethics, you get the whole range of human life that is looked at from an ethical point of view. And so you get sexual ethics. So ethics is essentially also the word morality. Morality is commonly used more personally in terms of my personal morality, and ethics is used more socially in terms of our corporate ethics, but actually they mean the same thing. It's essentially about what is right and what is wrong and how do we know it. What is good, what is, what is evil, and it's making those choices. Ethics and morality is about how we choose between right and wrong and the basis underlying that on which we choose. In other words, the knowledge, the values, the beliefs behind our choices that lead to right or wrong. So as the writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 5, he says, though to the Hebrew uh, believers, the Messianic believers, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk and not solid food because anyone who lives on milk is still an infant not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So the Christian life is a journey towards maturity through coming to terms with the truth of God through his word, which sets us free. Jesus said, you are my apprentices, my disciplined learners. The word disciple is a disciplined learner. You are my disciplined learners if you hold to my teachings. And the word hold to has got two meanings. If you study them or know them by obeying them. In Hebrew understanding, I've only understood something if I obey it. I don't say in my mind, yes, I know, and then do differently. If you hold to my teachings, then you are my disciples and you will then know the truth and you will live the truth which sets you free from all your, neuro all your neuroses, all your complexes, all your misbeliefs, all your mixed stuff. It's a progressive journey towards freedom. So maturity is this constant growth and training to discern and distinguish between right and and wrong, good and evil. And in the explosion of the information highway and the internet and the global, in our global village, with this mass tsunami of knowledge coming our way, the greatest need in the world today is discernment. Is to actually be able to distinguish what's true, what's not true, what's half true, what is spun truth, what is fake news? I mean, we just lived through in, in American politics this tremendous ideological clash of, of lies, fake news, and uh, to wade through what is really true is actually very, very difficult. So it's uh, this training for reigning 
by learning to distinguish right from wrong, good from evil, and to actually live the truth and live the good and become the good. Jesus spoke a lot about being a good person whose roots reveal the fruits of God's goodness and character versus being a bad person. Out of the heart comes the stuff that reveals the fruit of who you are. So what comes out the mouth reveals your inner character. So lying, exaggerating, cutting corners, the way you talk to people quickly reveals what has formed you deeply inside, whether you're a good tree or a bad tree, a good person or a bad person. This is all about ethics and morality, which sexuality is at the heart of it. So it's symbolized in the garden of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God put all the trees in the garden and there were two particular trees of life and of the knowledge of of good and evil. They could eat all the trees, including the tree of life, but not the one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it was just simply a test because God didn't make uh, Adam and Eve or human beings robotic in terms of just we have to do God's will, but we have free will. Created in God's image means we can choose. God is a fully self-determining being. We are partially self-determining beings. We have will and choice like God, and we can choose to disobey or not. Adam and Eve had the choice to eat of the tree of life and enjoy fellowship with God and come to know what they needed to know when they needed to know it, by a long obedience in the same direction, as opposed to reaching out to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and taking into their own hands what they wanted to know when they wanted to know it. You see, they grasped for knowledge for which they didn't have the character to handle. They grasped for knowledge. And the temptation, you see, the very first sin, temptation that came into the world was lying. The serpent lied to Eve and then to Adam. Lying is the beginning of the corruption of human character. That's why Jesus called Satan the father of lies. So by a lie, he said, don't you know that If you eat, did God really say you mustn't eat of that tree? Don't you know that if you eat of that tree, you won't die? God was lying. You will actually be like God. He's insecure. He was keeping it from you. Reach out and you will, if you eat of that tree, you will immediately, instantly know right from wrong, good from evil. God's plan for human beings was only to know good always and eventually have the character to then actually face evil and defeat it. But they actually reached out and for knowledge to be God, self-idolatry. And this is the constant choice we have. So we come to know in Christ by eating Jesus is the tree of life, the tree of the cross is the tree of life where the water and the blood that we drink or eternal life actually gives us life. And once again, now as believers, eating from the tree of life, we come to know good from evil through training our our spiritual faculties to know the truth that sets us free and therefore to distinguish it from evil and to defeat evil and reverse Adam and Eve's original sin. So, therefore, the, as it says in the book of Hebrews, the truths of God's word is the basis of distinguishing and knowing and choosing right from wrong. And this applies to human sexuality in particular. But, we, but it implies an integrated approach to truth and to knowledge. You know, to be biblicist or fundamentalist is just to say, I only read the Bible, everything in the Bible is true, the whole Bible is true, even the pages and the letters, and we almost worship the Bible. It's a literalist, fundamentalist view of the Bible, and you don't read anything else. But John Wimber had a phrase. He said, everything in the Bible is true, but not all truth is in the Bible. And therefore, how many of you know there's a lot of truth 
in the human sciences. As an example, you know, mathematics. So 8 plus 8 equals 16. Now give me the chapter or verse to prove that's true. Where does it say in the Bible 8 plus 8 is 16? If you don't give me the chapter or verse, I don't believe it. If it's not in the Bible, I don't want to know anything about it. Have you heard that attitude? It's called fundamentalism. Fundamentalist Islamics, who are jihadists, who are literalists, and fundamentalist conservative evangelicals, who are just head in the sand, only the, only the Bible, Jesus, and me. Nothing else. Um, don't confuse me with the facts because my mind is already made up. The facts of science, of the hothouse effect, global warming, the facts of human sexuality as people study it in sexology, the study of human sexuality, the facts of economics. So all human sciences have got truth. Would you agree or not? But equally have got error. And so integrating biblical knowledge and biblical truth with human disciplines that we can all learn from to discover truth is really important. So we, we as evangelicals, hold to Scripture as the measure, the canon of truth and the inspiration of Scripture. We believe it's inspired by God and we learn to interpret Scripture as accurately as we can, but it's our filter uh, with which we interact with the world and with knowledge. So we really need to read other books. So I, had, I have books that I brought, which I'm going to show you tomorrow morning, and I was going to hold up one or two tonight. I'll get them at the break. It's really important you guys take seriously in this whole group of young people and interns here. Fantastic to have you. I hope you guys can make it tomorrow morning and Sunday morning and go through the whole journey because I'm going to be building talk after talk after talk on the, on the next talk. But it's so important you develop an appetite to read and study and broaden your knowledge because every, what the Bible teaches is true, but not all truth is in the Bible. And you need to read and investigate and research and integrate it. Um, that is, I think, a responsible learning. So that is what theological ethics is all about. And Klaus Nuremberger was the professor, the, the primary one, besides Len Halley and a, a few others that I studied and, and at UNISA. But this is his definition of theological ethics. And this is the exercise I'm going to be doing in this seminar. Theological ethics, he, 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 you know, in theological ethics, you have political ethics, the whole thing of political philosophy, whether you have communism, socialism, social democracy, democratic socialism, free enterprise, capitalism, globalism. What political philosophy or ideology from a theological evaluation point of view is the best that's closest to scripture and for the well-being of, um, of a nation. So there's a whole thing about political ethics. And Dave and a few others who know me, I am very much politically engaged and I don't sh shut my mouth, especially with guys like Ace Machashula and Jacob Zuma and others around. Christians should be more political than the politicians if we really are, are genuinely spiritual people. Economic ethics... Christians should lead economics in modeling God's stewardship when it comes to money and material resources. So there's a whole field of economic ethics. There's the whole field of social ethics. There's the whole field of medical ethics. There's the whole field of, social, of sexual ethics. There's the whole field of ecological ethics. So that was my bread and butter in theology in which I specialized in all of them. And the basic framework that, that Nuremberger worked with is ethics is about three steps. What is the situation? So what are, if you're doing political ethics, what is the current situation? So it implies analysis of the current condition. The next step is then what ought to be the situation, which is the vision from Scripture, from God's point of view, of God's preferred future. 
What is God's vision and ideal in this area of life? And then the third step is, how can we be freed to move from the real to the ideal, from this present context of pain, once having analyzed its social analysis, presenting the vision of the truth of God's word that sets us free, and then how can we be healed, transformed into living that kind of society that God wants for South Africa? Do we have a vision for this country under God? A preferred future for this nation that's better than what the politicians offer? Everyone is now chup still. And the same with sexuality. So we're going to apply these three steps. So it brings me to this agenda, and then we're going to have our break. Therefore, this is what we're going to look at in this um, healthy sexuality conference together. First of all, awareness of key resources and also of some terms and language, which is an exploding language in the area of sexuality. Defining a few key terms like sexuality, psychosexual gender, then a comment about Biblical anthropology, in other words, the biblical view of human nature. Because you have in psychology today an assumption of the human being on which theories of psychology are built. And you need to have underlying assumptions re-examined in light of Scripture. What is a biblical psychology, a biblical anthropology, the biblical understanding of the human being? And then biblical interpretation. You guys have heard of the word hermeneutics, homiletics. They're the cousins of obelix and asterisk. <laughs> you know those guys. But hermeneutics is the Greek word, or comes from the Greek word, for principles of interpretation. So how we interpret Scripture is very, very important. And so in sexual ethics especially, we work from Jesus and Paul back to the Old Testament. We look at how Jesus used interpretation of Scripture to explain his sexual ethics. How Paul used his interpretation of Scripture to explain his sexual ethics. And we copy them and follow them because at the end of the day, I don't know about you, I'm a follower of Jesus. Are you? And then we look at the three steps of sexual ethics in terms of human sexuality in general, but then also tomorrow I will talk about LGBTIQ and how we work with that in terms of Scripture. There is LGBTIQ hermeneutics, that basically interprets Scripture in an affirming way. And then there is uh, other interpretations of Scripture that would say differently. And we're going to examine that tomorrow morning. And end up then talking about pastoring and healing. Sexuality in general, LGBTI persons as well as sexuality in general. So those are the, are, are the seven points that we're going to be working with over our journey together. And I'll focus on the first few briefly, but I'll spend my major time on the biblical vision of human, healthy human sexuality and, and LGBTIQ and the healing. So, we can now have a five-minute pause, and then when we come back, your reward is the results of the survey. All right, so can we put that uh, QR code up again if anybody's still needing that while you stretch your legs? So stretch your legs for a moment, guys, and if you want to finish your survey, do that quickly, and then afterwards we can post the results. So.
while we finish that survey, if anybody needs help, um, uh, Benny's here with a phone as well, and uh, we can you can use another phone, not not your own. If your phone is inadequate, he can help you do it as well. So come and see Benny. Benny in the front here. Right, guys, you can come back inside, grab your seats again. You like to use the, the evening well? You uh, got the results ready for us there, Simone? Eh? Of the questionnaire. Okay, we're going to put the results of the questionnaire up straight away. So you can uh, scroll through that and have a look at it. Okay, 65 responses. There we go. So you need to come watch them if you want to catch the results. What's the matter? Sorry. Okay, thank you. There we go. 65 responses so far. Slightly more guys. Then ladies in the in the room. Some people not sure. Some prefer not to say. Okay, just keep rolling. Eh? Is the age spread? You can have a quick scan of the age spread that's present in the in the room tonight. Okay. Okay, slightly more in accountable relationship than, than, than does not. Okay. 
Saltars. A small percentage recognize that. 15% and then sex outside of marriage. Not okay. 86%. Same sex. Not okay. Again, 86%. LGBTQI. Predominantly heterosexual relationships. Going to foster, okay, slow it down, masturbation. It's not okay, 56%. Okay, there's some debate around that. Those who are mol molested, uh, 34%. So over a third of, of attendees. Those who were molesting others, 10%. And then the experience of pornography. Um, where did that take place? Predominantly in homes. Office, secondly. Thank you. What device? Obviously, cell phones, tablets, obviously, the primary ones, computer second. Well, when? Uh, early, early evenings, predominant. Sexual healing. Uh, 35, 36. 35, yeah. Marital status. 46% married. 32 is the next one over there. Okay. 13% are dating. All right. How many years are you married? Just look at it. We've got slow there. Everybody can get a look at it. It's quite a widespread, eh? Of very widespread of years married, eh? And virginity, thirty-two percent. Yeah, so that's quite a significant number for us as well, eh? To be thinking about happily married. Yeah. Predominantly faithfulness. It's nine, nearly ten percent acknowledge that it's been dealt with. <coughs> Love six, twenty two, and twenty two percent. Yeah. Importance of sex in those marriages. Yeah. Good or bad sex. All those are enjoying it, it looks like. <laughs> Love making. Uh, how many times a week? Look at that, guys. I mean, don't go so fast. Yeah, she's going so quick. She's blushing there. <laughs> you want to hear? She's going so fast. Huh? Yeah. Communication about sexual intimacy. There we go. Mostly find it good to talk about it. And then the challenges in sexuality within those marriages. There we go. Um, fidelity, premature ejaculation, and experience of abuse, and then a few others, uh, a few percentage on one spouse more likely to initiate, 
bondage, orgasm, mental illness, medications getting in the way. And then on the single side, virginity. Uh, <coughs> oh, okay. 21, 22% not before marriage. Okay, so here we have uh, responses if you're not married. What's how far can you go? Questions, eh? Done. All right, did anybody want to check up any of those results? We can go back to some. Okay, to give you some idea what we're looking at uh, over this weekend in terms of the attendees. So thanks for doing that, guys. It gives us some idea. Alexander can, uh, yeah, thanks, Josh. Thanks, uh, Benny, for putting it together as well. Eh? Appreciate that. Thanks, Alexander. You want to go for it? Yeah, thank you for whoever put that together and did all the work. We appreciate it. Where is it? It's Benny. Ben, Ben, Benny. Thank you, sir. That's good. Yeah, I, I, I noticed Dave went over a few quite quickly. <laughs> or, or was it the one at the back? <laughs> all right. Um, so I just spoke to Dave briefly. Um, in the break now that I want to be sensitive to where people are at and I don't want to pitch this kind of too technical, too high and maybe to hopefully really make it relevant and accessible, the information that I'm sharing. So maybe we should stop a little earlier and have Q&A and uh, I'm happy to dialogue because then it's around felt needs and not just what I've only prepared to share with you. So we'll see how we go. And uh, you're welcome to think of some questions. I'd really love to engage in a bit of dialogue so that we actually are dealing with what's on your mind and not only just what I'm presenting. So I'm going to go through uh, what I've prepared, some aspects very quickly and skim over it. If I miss some stuff, you won't know that I've missed it and try to zero in what I think probably is more pertinent and then have a bit of Q&A and the same tomorrow morning. So that we have teaching and Q&A and we're going to end up at some point having ministry time as well. So I shared the um, list of things that would cover a seminar like this or a conference like this. So just in terms of resources to start off with, um, again, certain key books that one can recommend, and um, there is uh, uh, the Vineyard uh, movement so, um, in, in South Africa and the US and England did a position paper um, related specifically to LGBTI community, but at the back is a very helpful bibliography of books on human sexuality, and one of the key books which I can recommend, which is really remarkable, as you can see, it's a big tome. It's Richard Davidson is an Old Testament scholar, an expert in Hebrew, and he's, he's called it the Flame of Yahweh, Sexuality in the Old Testament, and it is really incredibly helpful. And a book that's very much more recent that uh, summarizes the overview, it's Understanding Gender Dysphoria by Mark Yarhouse. He's a guy in England. And again, it's the discussion of the psychosexual area of gender, gender formation, identity, and dysphoria. And I do recommend um, other books. There's a, a book that I have up here by two Catholic a theologian and a psychologist, Ferda and Hegel, Your Sexual Self. It's the best book that I've found on the development of human sexuality from the beginning all the way through to later in life and where gender identity formation starts and takes place. And it really helps one to understand. And if you are molested 
or there are certain things that happen at different stages of development, there is the arresting of your sexual development, which then later in healing ministry has to be revisited. And so this is a, that's a very, very helpful book. And then William Loder's New Testament on Sexuality. So those are just some resources, but to say there's nothing better than living people and also focused uh, coursework and ministries like Living Waters and now The Journey and other ministries that work in the area of, um, of sexual wholeness or, or relational well-being because human sexuality is essentially about relational health. So in terms of terms and language use, there is an explosion of terms and meanings. I was just looking on the internet the other day that in the state of New York, they've got up to 31 officially recognized gender designations. So it's not just LGBTIQ, P, it goes on and on. And so it's, that's not only in, in that aspect of human sexuality, but the language and the technical. So human sexuality has a language of its own with a lot of technical terms. And um, d don't get confused, but I think it's important to know what we mean when we use certain terms and how we use it so that we don't offend people and as much as possible are sensitive uh, to be correct. There is obviously the other extreme of political correctness that if, if you don't use the right term, then you've really offended someone and they beat up on you. So I'm just drawing attention to this because it can be bewildering and it can become quite complex. But have you heard of, of cisgender? and all the, all, the rela all the related terms. It, you would do well just to become um, a fay with some of them so that when you talk in this area of human sexuality, you talk with sensitivity and you know what you mean and what people mean by certain terms. But it's the movement from theology integrating with psychology, sexology, and other disciplines, and then back again. In other words, when it comes to human sexuality, it's really about a multidisciplinary approach. Now, defining human sexuality. So human sexuality is, is more than just sex or your sexual identity in terms of your biological birth, whether you are born male or female. But human sexuality essentially is about how we experience our body selves as male and female bodies in our living and in our relating to others. And so it's both personal and relational how we experience the world around us in our body selves. And God has differentiated in the body self, male and female. And three key words or ideas explain this idea of sexuality. Embodiment, love, and energy. And uh, there is a a well-known uh, uh, um, sexual ethicist, James Nelson, in, uh, at Harvard in, in America, has written a whole number of books on human sexuality, but his, his thickest book is, is simply called Embodiment, Healthy Human Sexuality. And the idea of embodiment is that it's, it's that as male and female, which is all about nature and biology, what is the journey to grow into men or women, and masculine men and masculine women. The journey from being born a male baby to be a boy into manhood and healthy masculinity is not an automatic given. And there are many factors that go into that journey. And it's essentially about being comfortable in our own bodies with the psychosocial development in our consciousness in terms of our sense of who we are sexually in relation to other people. And that is very complex. And uh, so embodiment is important. So sexuality is tactile. It's about our bodies and the way we conduct ourselves. And it's essentially then about love. It, it, our deepest need in the human being is for love. It's to be loved and to love. is to belong. And so this idea of sexuality as love learning to love people in a healthy, pure way with the whole of who we are, or lusting, 
which is using people for our pleasure, for our purposes. So we either honor people as the mysterious, beautiful, created image of God, or we see people as objects of use for our purposes, for our satisfaction. That's lust and that's love. Human sexuality is fundamentally about lust or love. And, and so that has to do with the hunger for relationships, which is about authentic intimacy, closeness, bonding, this idea of union and completion. So what God has built into creation, and another author on this is, is called yearning. The book is just called Yearning. God's built into creation this deep, instinctive yearning for completion in the other, this yearning for union, for belonging, for embrace, and for oneness. And that's the journey of learning to love in healthy, pure sexuality, as opposed to lust. And underlying that, then, is eros. So agape, the Greek word that the New Testament writers chose for love, as in pure love, is also uh, has um, eros, the Greek word for passionate love, erotic love. Erotic love is not necessarily sinful. Many Christians think eros and erotic love is bad. But it's actually about energy. Sexu human sexuality is the fire that burns within us, that energizes human relationships. And so um, there's a lot of good stuff on this. There's a guy, George Maloney, whom I've learned a lot from. He's written a book on... He, it's called Why Not Become Totally Fire? <laughs> and it's a whole study on God as fire in the burning bush. God is in eternal fire. And then it, the fire of our sexuality, which goes back to Song of Solomon, the very flame of Yahweh. God has fired this world into being. And in that sense, sexuality is God's gift of energetic fire in us, passion, desire. And so to love is not just a kind of a, a stoic decision that I'm going to just do good to you. But love is deeply passionate. Sexuality is deeply passionate. It's not just um, an arm's length act of goodness to other people. So this whole thing of energy and passion, a lot of people, they are, they are so broken in their sexuality, they have no passion. They're not passionate. And if you truly are a lover of God and you're healthy in your sexuality, you'll be a warm, intimate, passionate person who when you engage with people, they feel the energy of God coming out of you because you love purely with the fire of Yahweh. So sexuality is, is in every atom of my being. It's not just in my genitals or in my hormones. Human sexuality is in every atom of my being. And it will be perfected in the resurrection, in the perfection of love. So just a comment now, which I'll come back to later, is in Luke chapter 20, when, when Jesus was asked about marriage and in the resurrection, the one woman had a husband who died and then the brother of the husband married her for the obligation to keep the family name. Then he died and the other brother, I think she was maybe... You know, a widow, a black widow, or whatever they call it. But five husbands died. Um, I don't know what she was doing with them, but nevertheless. And so then they asked, <laughs> then, then they asked, so in the resurrection, whose husband will she be? Um, the, I think I, she received a five-fold ministry. <laughs> but Jesus said, you, err, you do err not knowing the scriptures. In the age to come, in the resurrection, in our resurrection bodies, we will transcend human sexuality in the sense of, of marriage, of procreation. In other words, it will not be genitally focused or erotic. That will be transcended in, the, in love perfected. So the, the biological genitalized erotic sexuality is a this age gift for bonding, covenant, procreation, pleasure, and companionship. But it's all a parable to teach us to love as God loves purely and passionately, which in resurrection bodies will be perfected because we will transcend 
that element of human sexuality without losing the identity of who we are. Because around the throne of God in heaven, it says people from all languages, all tribes, all nations, you remember that, are around the throne. So um, God's diversity in ethnicity, 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 Ethnicity <laughs> and uh, cultures will be are recognizable, but re- but reconciled in a rich unity of colorful diversity. So equally, I will not be a, a genderless or sexless being in the resurrection. But when our bodies are saturated with spirit. It will transcend sexuality as we know it in the perfection of pure love. The fire of God's passionate love that is pure and devoid of all mixed motives in terms of wanting to use for our purposes. That is the energy of sexuality. So healthy sexual people are full of energy who learn to love purely with tactile embodiment of warmth and affection and touch, and they impart the fire of God. I hope that that helps you. Broken sexuality is about broken embodiment. You despise your body. You hate your body. You reject your body. You question your body. Eating disorders, cutting, all the stuff that goes with with all the, the warped body image. We are We need to be incarnated human beings. God, the mystery is God took on human flesh in the incarnation. And God sanctified our bodies by becoming a human body and taking on a human body. And the human body is sacred and important. And embodiment, God became embodied. You know that there's a human body in the Trinity. The eternal Son of God before His incarnation was spirit as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that eternal Son became a human being in a human body, died and rose again, and that resurrected body ascended into heaven and has forever changed the Trinity. There's a human being body in the Trinity. Jesus, who opens the way for all of us human bodies transformed, saturated by spirit to enter the Trinity and love as purely in the fire of the Trinity as the Trinity loves. And the opposite of brokenness of love is lust, of etc. So that's just some introductory idea of what sexu- human sexuality is and means. And then psychosexuality is the development from our biology to the psychology and the psychosocial emotional formation of our sense of self as sexual beings, which is called gender. Uh, the, the masculine, the feminine, gender identity, gender formation, and gender roles, which is the big area of struggle and pain, which is more recently called gender dysphoria, gender identity confusion. There are different words about this. Um, But um, again, some are more politically correct and some people don't like that because this is the latest. But it really is a world that is very complex and needs to be dealt with sensitively and compassionately. So up here I've got an important slide now on uh, um, understanding sex and gender to summarize it. And this is from uh, Mark Yahas who is a a medical man, a specialist um, in psychology um, and and sexology. So biological sex is essentially about being born as male and female or, um, or female. Gender identity develops out of biological sex but is influenced by psychosocial emotional formation which has to do about becoming a man or a woman. And the gender role is about the masculine or feminine traits. And that is the binary in God's creation design, which we're going to talk a lot about tomorrow morning. But then there are exceptions to these binaries, male and female, man, woman, masculine, feminine. And this is where the... the, the um, the pain, dysphoria, and searching begins, and brokenness, and healing, and health. 
So there is biological sex, as in being born male or female, but in between is intersex. And intersex is the technical term for um, biological um, anomalies, if you want to call it that. And immediately if a person is intersex of one degree or another, would say, I'm not an anomaly. I'm, I'm created in God's image. So it's difficult which word to, to choose. But there's a spectrum of biological birth, where, where some people are born uh, X, Y, male, X, X, female, then, then X, Y, X, and different chromosomal uh, combinations with outward genitals, sometimes both, the old word hermaphrodite, when you have both genitals, or partially one, or outward female genitals, but inward inward testosterone, um, or vice versa. And then, so you get um, a lot of variations of intersex that is biologically related from, from formation in the womb and birth. And that is a very difficult ethical field of decision-making as to how to guide a baby and make decisions about surgical intervention or not, and how and when and let them grow up. But choices have to be made whether this is a boy or whether this is a girl, and to work with it. So there requires a lot of compassion and sensitivity. I read a paper some time back by a Catholic ethicist, who's a medical ethicist um, in, in the U.S., an expert on intersex. And he says, just from he said, and this was, I don't know, I think six years ago, the statistic was one in 4,500 babies has one form of intersex complications to extreme to mild. So it is an issue that needs to be, that we need to be aware of. Gender identity as man or woman, and in between is androgyny. And androgyny is not just being asexual, neither male nor female, but it's on a continuum from being a man or a woman and, and feeling like a man inside a woman's body or a woman inside a man's body and all the permea permeations in between. So transsexual has become a big issue in recent years and is, and is discussed. And once again, these are not moral issues as in right or wrong. These are realities that have to be faced and worked with. From a theological point of view, you would say it's some form or expression of broken creation. If you talk about the norm as male and female, man and woman, masculine and feminine, and you talk about the in-betweens of the variations, um, th then they would say, but if I'm one of those, am I not normal anymore? So it becomes quite difficult. But the, the dominant pattern is the binary and the, the minor patterns are the in-betweens. But they are real and have to be faced and worked with. And so when it comes to gender role, the difference between the masculine and the feminine, masculine traits, uh, wh what are they? So you get a stereotypical list of this is what masculine traits are, and you get a feminine st a stereotypical list of what the feminine traits are. And again, it, they are debatable because you can have... Men supposedly are analytical problem solvers, go-getters, but um, and women are, are nurturing and environmental and relational. But you know, I've learned healthy m men who are whole in their sexuality are deeply nurturing and relational as much as women are. Except it comes through a healthy male body. And Healthy women in their sexuality can be very analytical and problem-solving and can outdo men on many things, except it's expressed in a different way in the feminine through a female body. So we've got to be very careful. But this whole middle range of outside the cultural norms, a lot of these things are culturally, culturally determined. So if people show gender roles 
gender traits outside the cultural norms from one extreme to the other. It's not to judge them. It's to sit and understand and listen and learn and journey with them as compassionately and and sensitively as we can by God's grace to help them to find a place of identity, healthy identity. Identity. So this book, Gender Dysphoria, dysphoria is dis-ease, is, is restlessness, frustration. Um, it, it, it's a general term that expresses the searching and this longing. So when you talk about LGBTIQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, LGBT, transsexual, I, in, intersexual, Q, some say queer which for some is a disparaging term, so they change it to questioning. And then you get P, pansexual. Then you get F, fluid sexual, or fluid gender, rather. Pan gender, fluid gender. And it's largely around gender formation. And the sad reality is that the extreme becomes ideological where they separate between sexual identity as an biological birth and gender identity which you decide as and when you want to by the way you feel and it's a new Gnosticism of a separation between biology and and nurture so I'm I'm just explaining this to say it does become complex but it it is profoundly real for people and anyone here listening to me and online who is in the journey in your sexuality and gender towards wholeness, and you wrestling with any of these issues to one degree or another, just know God is with you, and you are not rejected. It's real. Heterosexual people who apparently have no problems and are straight have, the, have equally deeply problems, but in different ways. We all have our measure of struggle with our sexuality, if we're honest. And so... When it comes to biblical anthropology, understanding human nature, there is this nature-nurture debate. And generally it's presented as 50-50, and they they can influence each other, and to what degree they influence each other. So we're born in nature as biological male or female, boys or girls. But then through nurture, socialization, emotion, psychology, culture, we are formed in our um, gender, and we make decisions about how, what gender we are. And they say it's like 50-50, and as I've said, the extreme is now that there's separation between the two, and you self-identify um, as often as you feel the need to. But from a biblical point of view, it's not just nature and nurture. There is a third component which I always advocate, and it doesn't seem to gain much traction. But um, I don't believe in 50-50. I believe in a third, a third, a third, and the dynamic interaction between them. Because the Bible says we are body, soul, and spirit. And body, soul, and spirit. So body speaks of our biology, our sex. Soul speaks of our mind, emotions, the psychosocialization, which speaks of our gender. But also we are spirit, and spirit is the will to choose. The spirit of God, our spirituality. Spirituality is all about character formation. And character is all about ethics and morality. Your choices that you make in life and that you live with for better or for worse. And how many of you know you make choices every day a thousand times for different things? We're always making choices. Every small thing we make choices. We were choosing a table to sit at. And we were wondering, there, there, or there, or some of the choices are (laughs) non-moral. But the point I'm making is this, that in psychology, the language is we have our temperament, which is often refers to our hard wiring, which seldom changes. Then we have our personality, which actually is more our development of our socialization into our personality, whether we flamboyant or not. So in Taylor Johnson, uh, Jungian psychoanalysis, 
They, they say introvert, extrovert is more like the hard wiring. Then you can be socialized more as an introvert to be a little bit more extrovert. So you go through the personality formation. But character is different. Character is the formation of godliness or lack thereof, of your spirituality. So I believe human beings from a biblical point of view are nature, nurture, socialization, and the choices we make. And how many of you know that God is a God who chooses? You know, Storm's River Mouth, I, there's a bridge over it, hey? I always, when I come this way and I've been there, I'm still amazed. Is this still the highest bridge or is it the Blokrans Bridge? It's the highest bridge. God would stand there and say, I decide, let there be a bridge. And instantly there would be a bridge. Human beings stood there at some point in the apartheid era. They stood there and they said, let there be a bridge. And three years later, there was a bridge. <laughs> Because they made the decision, they got the engineers, they got the planners, they got the quantity surveys, and they did everything, and they worked, and eventually there was a bridge. You know, we can create. We make decisions that affect reality. So your decision-making as to how you respond to your biology and what you believe about it, and your decision-making about how you respond to your gender and what you decide about it, and on what basis you decide, I am a man, or I am a woman, or I am pansexual, or I am this, or I am that. We all make decisions on the basis of certain fears, emotions, beliefs, cultural pressure, theology, and those decisions are as important, if not more important, than biology and nurture. And so human beings are not victims of socialization, and neither are we biologically determined beings. We are biology, we are socialization, but we also character in terms of the ability to choose. And if we understand that, it immediately provides an answer to most, if not all, sexual challenges and, and identity challenges. You are not a victim of what you think and believe about yourself, or how you feel, or what your body tells you, there is a God in heaven. No matter what, there is a God in heaven who sent his son Jesus. And in Christ, we can make choices that actually help to shift and change things, whereby we know truth that sets us free and heals us. So we still then face this challenge. So... Um, oh, being and becoming, therefore, is the dynamic interaction of biological determining and psychosocial formation, but is profoundly affected by our choices and our beliefs about them. So, enough on that. Let me check where I'm at. Whoa. I didn't even know. Look at the time. I have got carried away. I said I would stop, and I haven't stopped. Cheers, people. <laughs> Sorry, I was not checking time. I'm stopping right here, right now. Questions, comments. What are you hearing? Is it making sense? Is it opening up the subject? You want to ask any questions? I don't mind any question. There was a question there about orgasms because he spoke about climax right at the beginning of the meeting. Nothing is forbidden here. No embarrassing any question or comment about what you're hearing me teach and say. I try personally to be very open-minded when it comes to the LGBTQ plus community um, because as a Christian, you're meant to love everyone, or at least that's how I understand it, whether you agree with their decisions or not. So it's very interesting to hear a different side of it because I haven't heard the biblical teachings on it. I haven't heard what we're, act what we're meant to be, well, not meant to be thinking, but at least 
the educational part of it. So I find it really, really interesting, and I really want to thank you for that because we don't normally hear it. It's just like it's the same way normally sex isn't taught in church. It's not taught how to create a relationship properly in a, in a, and have a healthy sexuality. So thank you. <laughs> okay. I appreciate that. And your name is? Marily. It, it's Marily. Thank you for your comment. Really appreciate that. Really good coming from the younger generation. How do the young people feel? What have you heard me say? Have I left you confused at a higher level? Or not? Well, if... Oh, well. There are questions coming online. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeez, I forgot we're online. <clears throat> Can he read the results because we can't see them? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Anne Salmon. Anne. Auntie Anne. Uh, all clear here on the Isle of Man. Wonderful. The sun's shining there. You blessed. Um, LGBTQI, please. Okay. Could you please expand on how I choose to be a woman? The thought never entered my mind. I'm not sure <laughs> if that is serious. Maybe we ask a question through this platform. Well, those were the questions. You say, okay, yes, you can ask a question through this platform. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've answered them. How do I choose to be a man or a woman? Uh, the journey of psychosocial formation of gender identity, uh, we, we can talk more about, but it, it, it is really... The ideal of creation design is a man and a woman in a covenant of marriage who have children and are raised in a covenant relationship of the masculine and the feminine that models to them the journey from biological, uh, biological male to young boy to adolescent manhood to masculine men and not toxic masculinity. Because the periods of development where, where experimentation starts in terms of your sense of self and the innocent uh, playing with genitals, often um, boys with boys and girls with girls, um, eight, nine, ten years old, um, they, if one understands what happens at each stage of development, what is innocent versus what becomes problematic, and where guidance, not intervention, but where gui understanding and guidance is needed if required by wise, loving parents as opposed to scolding and reprimanding that gives wrong messages that start leading to guilt, etc. That journey I, um, takes a while if one explains it responsibly, but choices are involved along the way. And I don't just stop one day and decide, oh, I'm a man. There is the subconscious formation that tells me I'm a boy and then a man. This gentleman, what's your name? That's David. David. You know, I seldom, if ever, <laughs> where I travel, have to look up to a man. <laughs> David, won't you stand? I just want to show you how small I am. Look at this guy. Yeah, say David. Oh, but yes, Oh, There's another tall man coming. <laughs> What's your question? Um, so this is obviously very complex and quite new. I think um, you know that gender dysphoria uh, book. I'm sure it would be very interesting. <clears throat> Um, having studied a bit of biology, etc., at varsity myself, the intersex um, bi biology is obviously quite rare. Yeah. Um, and that's perhaps a slightly different... Uh, well, the question really is, 
um, if you've got the simplicity of the biology, you know, you've got the binary male and female. Yeah. There obviously are complexities that come with the social and the, you know, uh, those influences. But is there a different approach that you take if it's um, the, the biology is complicated with mm. the chromosomes, uh, which is a very small percentage, versus if the biology is simple? Um, is there a difference in approach? If I understand your question correctly, David, I'll say yes and no. There's, there, 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 there is a different approach in the sense that um, XY and XS, X chromosomes, quote-unquote, straight, clear, boy or girl, um, one raises them as a, a boy or girl. Um, in their formation, if the little boy at the age of five or six experiments with putting on his sister's dress or something, there's either the message that it's wrong, bad, or talk about it, understand, guide them, and the presence of a father with a son is very important to draw the son out of the world of the mother into which he was born so that he identifies with the father as a, as a boy with a man. And the, the father's presence also with the daughter is important to draw the daughter out of the mother's world into which she was born to help her differentiate between the, the, the man and the woman and rebond with the mother as a woman with a woman. So these formations can be fairly straightforward. When it comes to intersex biology, then other decisions are made and you've got to treat them differently depending on the nature of the biological anomaly or challenge and the, the interdisciplinary diagnosis of what treatment, how invasive and when it ought to be, whether it's surgical or not, or just medical or therapy or whatever. But sometimes it's, it's extreme and it can become very complex. So that's a whole world of medical ethics um, because it's about biology and intersex issues. I don't know if I'm answering the question. Very much uh, uh, clarifying. Um, thank you. And Perhaps a follow-up question. If you had to look at the proportions of um, the discussion, you talk about the discussion of uh, all of these things globally, what proportion is actual bio biological intersex and what proportion is sort of more binary? Yeah, you can see this guy knows a few things. You've studied. Look, it's hard to say the exact proportion and accurate, and I'm not an expert in this field, David, but... From my reading and understanding, I would say by far the focus is on gender, psychosocial, cultural formation, and your sense of self as a man or woman, masculine or feminine, as opposed to the biology of male and female. So the weight is on this side, and the smaller fo focus is on this side, um, in my experience. I mean, the big... The big dysphoria, the big searching is about, this, about the gender issues more than biological sexual issues, although they're there and it's real. And as I said, if the statistic is correct from that Catholic ethicist that I read years ago, I clearly remember one in 4,500 babies on average have one or other form of biological challenge that can be diagnosed or classified as intersex. And it's on a spectrum of things. So one in 4,500. Um, wh whereas gender dysphoria issues is way more common than that these days. And the, the, the more history goes on, and another is a, a, a woman, uh, uh, I can't remember her name from Harvard University, has written about technology and sexuality. And she says, in our increasing technological society, there is increasing inner alienation as functional surrogate beings because we use technology to relate now as surrogates, as surrogate relationships. And therefore, the deepening alienation from intimacy and authentic, intimate, face-to-face -face relationships. And she discusses a lot about this issue of, um, 
also formation and intimacy and how technology is affecting us. And with the advance of technology in postmodernism, we are coming into greater and greater neuroses. Um, there's a disintegration and fragmentation of the human psyche in many different ways, socially, in many ways. So the issue of gender is way bigger on, in the discussion than, than intersex. Alexander, a couple of questions online, yeah? Um, can you please expand on toxic masculinity, please? What is it? Toxic masculinity. Uh, there is healthy masculinity, and there is broken masculinity, and broken masculinity can turn toxic that truly damages the people around them. So we need to define what healthy masculine traits are and healthy masculinity as God intended men to be or designed or created men to be, what masculinity is, and then what is broken masculinity and when it turns toxic. So toxic masculinity, I would say, is abusive um, it manifests in different ways. Um, it's like, yeah, how it manifests in different ways. Gender-based violence is because of toxic masculinity. It's men who need surges of power through sexual violence. Rape is not about pleasure, it's about power. And so that is, that is truly broken toxic masculinity, asserting power over victims to get that surge that, the, 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 that your toxicity is craving. But that's just one form of it. Um, there's another one. I should look uh, there. You the, can look. the people are there, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to stare at me, it's quite all right. Huh? You are the people. <laughs> okay. So can a person within homosexuality lead in a church and kingdom context? Um, are there boundaries for their participation? So, if this person is asking the question, if you're, ask, if you're the person asking the question, please be here tomorrow morning, especially from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. That session, I'll be dealing with this. But the short answer is, there is a difference between being gay, as in same-sex orientation or attraction, versus acting out that attraction in same sex, same sex intercourse and genital or erotic loving. The Bible only prohibits, as I understand it, same sex practice, as opposed, and it does not comment on same sex orientation or attraction. That is this world that we have to work with honestly and realistically. So from a Christian church point of view, we, we, we must welcome and accept, love, live, work with people who are gay. The question is, like heterosexual people who have sex, premarital sex, or heterosexual people who commit adultery outside of marriage, um, the sin is sin. Gay practice, as in genital intercourse, is sin. The same as other forms of heterosexual sin. Gay sense of self, where you are same-sex attracted, is a reality that must be accepted, understood, and worked with for the person's good. And it's case by case. It's not a blanket rule. And so, where how and where they fit in in the church. Any person who's living in sin that is known to the leadership of the church that can affect the well-being of the body cannot participate in ministry or leadership and should be worked with in terms of helping to heal, free them from their besetting sin. But people who are gay but are celibate, you know what celibate is, and practice chastity, who have no sex, sexual engagement and no homosexual relationships as an erotic love, should be able to be baptized, become members, participate, worship, 
and engage in the life of the church. At what le level of leadership they are received into, I think that becomes the question of the gray area in terms of, of what they model in their choices of orientation that can then negatively affect um, the public model of God's creation design of male and female, husband and wife, of a biological man and a biological woman. So that's, that's in brief. Is that it? Well, people, you sure, I salute you. You guys, your bum must be numb. <laughs> Dave is coming to, to have mercy on you and put you out of your misery. Thank you so much. Eh? Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks to those who have been listening at home. And I'm, I just want to say uh, the survey was done of present attendees. So maybe not so very relevant to those at home. But those who are here, uh, we will scroll it down more slowly without comment. You can just look at it for yourselves while we have coffee. Is that thing happening there, Dean? Awesome. So you can stick around and have a cup of coffee or um, mocha. Ask mocha. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's just ask the Lord to bless us and, and lead us. Lord, would you take our thoughts and our questions and, uh, and commune with us on these things as we think through all these challenges and as we land on what is your mind and your heart for us. And we pray that this weekend would, would prove to be a time of great freedom and great healing for many, many people in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks. You can stick it on for us, Simone. Thank you.